Um, so I'm just gonna spot like this. Okay, you can change it to a gallery if you want, but that's just, it's easier that way for the recording. Um, so we are going to talk today a bit about different elements of the high holidays and a little bit even about Elul um, that are traditional, call them customs, rituals, aspects of the high holiday season and how we've either shifted it already into modern day or how we can. Um, I think for, for some people, the Elul period of time is one that is extremely uh, comfortable and normal and and something that people love to tap into and um, to use as kind of a, a self-spring cleaning, so to speak. Um, but it's also a time that can be very uncomfortable and feel therefore very unstructured and as a way of not necessarily getting us as prepared for the high holidays. So we're going to take a look at some of the different aspects of what's to come post Elul and in the high holiday uh, realm of Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur and see what some of those rituals and customs are and how we can turn them into meaningful aspects of the way that we might practice in more modern day um, and things that you can use in your own life, home, ritual um, that will bring meaning to, to let's call it ancient or traditional practices. So I'm going to share my screen here with um with a slideshow which is why i spotlit this zoom um and in a, in the slideshow i do have a um a link to a source sheet so if someone wants it at the end to be able to see just all the sources as opposed to the 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 slideshow itself you'll let me know and i'm happy to share it can people see this slide okay Yes. Okay, great. So the first piece that we're going to look at is the shofar, which seems to be a very, you know, normal aspect of Elul and the high holidays. But what some of you might not know is that the Mishnah actually begins discussing the shofar by saying that it's the primary mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah, right? That there's, that is the primary mitzvah. And therefore, for example, during COVID, we were very focused on how are people going to hear the shofar, not as focused, though we made sure that there was live streaming and YouTube available, but not as focused on how are people going to hear Torah reading or how are we going to make sure that people can hear Unatana Tokef, right? Those, those feel important and are important when in shul. And the, the Mishnah opens up by saying the number one mitzvah, the primary mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah, is actually sounding the shofar. So before we get to the next slide, can someone just tell me what is the actual mitzvah of shofar? Yeah, Barbara. It's hearing it, not blowing it. Great, exactly. I'm really glad that no board members are on here right now because I <laughs> I talked about this last night at the board meeting that the that the the mitzvah of shofar is not necessarily the person who is doing the blowing but actually the person who is doing the listening. And there's something powerful about that because it that means that it's amazing to have shofar blowers in the community who can, who can do that well and make it sound great. And also it's on all of us to actually bring ourselves to a space where we can hear the shofar. The onus is on the listener, on the ear, and not on the person who's quote, performing the mitzvah for us. Yeah, Taibo. Though, as the rabbis are wont to do, there is some obligation on the one blowing shofar to ensure that it's a kosher shofar. That's not on the blower, though. That's on the shofar. So just like the mitzvah of tzitzit. Well, wait, wait, why is it not on the blower? Because the one blowing could pick the wrong, could use a wrong animal horn. Like an un... Right, Why but that, isn't that it? doesn't. But that doesn't make the that that doesn't um that doesn't tell the blower that they've done something wrong. That is just the the onus is now on on the fact that the sound was not kosher, which we'll get to in a second. But but the um the, just like on a talit, the the mitzvah is not on the 
on the garment itself. It's the, the tzitzit, right? It's the it's the actual fringes. So when you put the tzitzit on, the mitzvah is in those fringes, not necessarily in the garment, right? So so similar to this shofar, that it does have to be made out of a certain animal, it does have to be made without blemish, etc. Um, but the the the, the blower themselves does not have to be um, of any certain. They have to be able to hear. Actually, is the one. Is oh, the one. Uh, what what I meant was on the blower that it's the obligation of the blower to get the right kind of show for, not to be the right kind of person. That's what I meant. Yeah. I, right. Uh, yes. Uh, but in not- Los Angeles, in Los Angeles, anybody that's blowing shofar is most likely bought it at a at a legitimate shop, Jewish shop. And they don't have to worry because they're sold to you as being maybe cars. Maybe there. <laughs> this is definitely not the point of this teaching, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stay on this topic for very long. But but the, the that might be true. And there are there are places that will sell shofars, not not like a a, a um what am I trying to say like a Judaica store, but but more so like if you go to Israel and you buy a shofar anywhere, it might not be a kosher shofar because you actually don't know from what animal it's made. Um, so you have to ask. But but I think that the the point is a good one that you you do need to have a kosher shofar, but that is not the mitzvah. The mitzvah is to listen to the shofar being being blown. So here we're going to look at two different texts. So this is one that that Taiwo was just kind of alluding to. So a shofar that was cracked and then glued together, even though it appears to be whole, is not kosher, is pasul. If one glued together broken fragments of shofar wrote to form a complete shofar, meaning like you had four different shofars, they had all broken into pieces, and now you're you're uh, gluing them together to make one full shofar, that shofar is also pasul. If the shofar was punctured and the puncture was sealed, if it impedes the blowing, the shofar is pasul, but if not, it is fit. Meaning, you've seen, you've probably seen very long shofar out. Um, and if they if there's a hole in the in the shofar, <laughs> in the in the in the horn, as long as it's been plugged up and you can still hear the sound without any uh variance in it it's totally kosher however if the sound is being somehow stifled or changed or um think of a reed instrument where one of the one of the um the um i can't think of the correct musical term but one of the pads is blocking the the sound that would not be okay the sound has to be pure so just tell me for a second why you think this might be. Why why do you think this is an important aspect of hearing the shofar? Yeah, Renee. I think if I remember correctly from your previous lectures, um, it's one of the things that's a mitzvah for everyone. Mm-hmm. True. Right. Right. But why why is this important? That it's not cracked, not glued together. Oh, why? Because that- it wouldn't it wouldn't be considered kosher if it's cracked and broken and whatnot so it wouldn't be we wouldn't be fulfilling the mitzvah of hearing the show it's not right kosher. so you're you're asking my same question so why is the mission the same that that makes it not kosher yeah paula maybe because it would change the sound okay great so, so yeah that that's what so any variation of the purity of the the purity of the instrument would change the purity of the sound Great. So we want to hear the purity of sound, which is going to take us to this next text. Now, I want you to just keep in mind, right, the whole idea of this class is to take these traditional ideas and then turn them into modern applications. So be thinking, why this text, right? Why why does Rabbi Schatz think that it's important for us to know that you can't have a shofar that's cracked in order to hear it as its pure mitzvah sound? Don't answer that question yet, Barbara. I just want to, do you have a question though? No, I was going to make a comment. Okay. That possibly there could be a danger to the person blowing because maybe the oh. crack could could come back and maybe it would split worse because of the sound. 
Interesting. Okay, great. Yeah. Potentially cause a danger to the person, or I mean, it's like if you'd have a kosher plate mm -hmm. and glue it together. I'm guessing that that wouldn't be kosher to use. I think it. I think it would. I mean, would it? yeah. I mean, as long as you don't. I mean, this is again a whole another topic, but as long as you don't put something on it where where it would go into the crack and it would be fine. But I, but I, but I hear your point about the shofar and I appreciate it, that, that there could be some kind of harm to the shofar blower, which again is the vessel for the mitzvah to be, to be done. So this next text is one that, that I find fascinating. And, and I think is what's going to um, bring us to, to figuring out how this could be something that we bring into modern day. If one sounds a shofar into a pit, as all of us do, obviously, or a cistern or into a large jug, if they clearly heard the sound of the shofar, they have fulfilled their obligation. Okay, so if you're hearing the sound clearly, even if you're blowing the shofar into something that feels like, like the sound could could kind of vacuum its way either away or somehow reverberate, if you're hearing it clearly without reverberation, um, you fulfilled your obligation. But if they heard the sound of an echo, they have not fulfilled their obligation. If you hear the sound bounce back at you, you haven't heard the shofar. You've heard an echo, but you haven't heard the shofar. And similarly, if one was passing behind a synagogue or their house was adjacent to the synagogue and they heard the sound of the shofar or the sound of the scroll of Esther being read, Megillat Esther, if they had kavana, if they focused their heart, meaning their intent to fulfill their obligation, right? They walked by and they said, I'm coming so that I can hear the shofar, or I know that I'm passing by at a time where I'm going to hear the shofar, they've fulfilled their obligation. But if not, they have not fulfilled their obligation. If you're just walking down La Cienega and you happen to hear the shofar being blown on, I guess it wouldn't be La Cienega, La Cienega on Corning, and you happen to hear the shofar being blown on the field, but you didn't know that you were going to hear the shofar, you've, you haven't fulfilled your obligation because you didn't have any intention around hearing the shofar, right? It's important from this passage of Mishnah that you hear the purity of the sound and that you have kavana, that you have intention. It actually says that you that you put your heart towards it, right? That you've somehow um, in kiven libo, if you've directed your heart towards the sound, that's what makes it fulfilling uh, towards the obligation. Uh, it is therefore possible for two people to hear the shofar blast, but only one of them fulfills their obligation. Even though this one heard and also this one heard, nevertheless, one focused their heart and the other one did not. So you could be taking a walk with a friend, with a partner, with a child. One of you could hear the shofar and know that that intention was there to hear the shofar. You fulfilled your obligation. But the same person at the same time hearing the same shofar might not have fulfilled their obligation because they weren't in a space to hear it. So how how is this something that could be turned specifically in a year where we are going to not hear the shofar the first day because it's Shabbat? How is this something that in modern day we bring into an element of practice with or without a shofar being blown, right? But how do we how do we make this something that is um that is relevant to to modern day ritual and practice? I'm asking you to write draw show, basically. That's what this class is for. Uh, yeah, Taiwo. <laughs> um, it's the way you introduce it and give it a context and get people to focus their attention. I mean, what's the, I can't believe I can't think of it, but the short intention prayer that's said before a lot of blessings. Short intention prayer said before a lot. It's Nimuhanun Zuma, something like that. Yeah, uh, that one, but then I think there's, right there's another the one. Jaw. Anyway, but whatever, uh, uh, and sometimes it's more than that. It's, I mean, just the sentence, it's, anyway, it's a way of telling, which is interesting when we think about it. Th 
think about it because the whole idea is the shofar. It's the sense that says pay attention. So the idea that you need that yeah. you're saying it's like another rabbinic sense. We're telling you to pay attention so you can really pay attention. Yeah, we're going to we're going to get to that in just a second. That's exactly right. That you're that here is a vessel to pay attention, but you have to know to pay attention to pay attention. <laughs> right. And there's there is that element of um, of extra kavana, so to speak. Yeah, Barbara. In the library minion that there's there's an anxiety on Saturday when we don't blow it and everybody looks forward to Sunday when we blow it, <laughs> which, you know, the kavana is there in your heart even before it happens. The Beautiful. Next day. Beautiful. So I think that you're you're bringing up something that rabbis all over the country are thinking about this year, which is we're all looking forward to something that we're going to have to wait an extra day to experience and how powerful that is, right? Yeah. Both the power in the silence and also the power in the excitement for, for not just having something happen because it always happens, but having something come... Um, come as not a surprise, but come as like this extra treat because we didn't have it the day before. Well, I mean, you, you've already told your kids that you're going to hear the shofar. You got to <laughs> listen and then they don't get to hear it. So right. get them to really be psyched up the next day sure. that you can psych your own self up. I, I would also like to add that when we did do it, blow it on the street corners, like yeah. we did yeah. blew it outside in our street corner. Yeah, it was an amazing thing. The Perlmans came, excuse me, the Shapiro Perlmans came. Yeah. <laughs> in addition, to, we had about 25 people there listening. Yeah. Kids from the house across the street. It was a phenomenal. I wish we did that every time, every year on this at two in the afternoon. We could bring it back. Lunch. I, it was just, it was invigorating. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I appreciate that it was invigorating. And I think that, I think you're right. I think there's something, there's something really powerful about hearing the shofar, right? I think that's why there are so many laws also around it, because we all understand that power and don't necessarily know how to articulate it. Um, but, but if there weren't rules and regulations and, and boundaries around how or what to hear, it might not be as powerful. Um, and so we definitely could, we definitely could bring it back. It would be something, it was something that I was very excited to put into play and took a lot of logistics, but it would be something that would be meaningful for people to be able to, to participate in, especially in a year where we only got it once in shul. Well, not once, but you know what I mean? Like one day in shul as opposed to both. Uh, Nancy. Yeah, it was done across the country. So it was a very, I thought that part was very yeah. powerful as yeah. well. So to me, this this so much talks about your intent about being to concentrate and and even when it's not about the shofar, I think it's important about our prayers that day and because it's so easy to be distracted by what's in your head sure. and and what's going on in the world. So I think it's a a reminder of of all of the mindfulness and concentration that we need to do. Although I think it's more than just the the rules and the laws around it that make it powerful. I think there's something powerful about the sound. Oh, totally. maybe that's ancient memory. You know, like it's yeah. just very powerful. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think I think the point the point of me bringing up the boundaries and rules and regulations is because I think if we didn't have that, we could have broken shofars and we could have right and then and then that sound wouldn't be as powerful because it might not be done as um, let's call it beautifully though we all know it's not always beautiful but that that <laughs> those tones right wouldn't necessarily come out in the same way. So I totally agree with you. I think the the sound itself is really what is the power. Um, but to your other point about intention, I think that's that's exactly what this is, right? When I teach my students about this text, um, my sixth graders, I teach them this text because I want them to understand what kavana is. I want them to understand that the echo isn't enough, right? Not that it's not a good first step, right? People who heard the shofar only over Zoom during um, during COVID, no one said not good enough, right? No one said, oh, tisk tisk, you didn't hear the shofar. You did. Would it have been better though for you to hear it in person? Yes, right? Because we want to be part of that moment of hearing the shofar and getting that feeling of real 
connection of something that's really waking us up individually. Um, we were talking about this this morning in class that so much of the high holidays is done communally, but about very individual topics. And the shofar too, we hear it in a group very often, but it's supposed to be something that we hear for ourselves because it can't be heard for us. Um, so, so, and it can't be done for us, right? I mean, it, it, the shofar can be blown for us, but it can't be, it's not an action where we can have a shaliach and say like, can you go hear the shofar while I, I don't know, go have lunch, right? There's, you, you have to be part of, part of that experience. Um, the only other thing that I'll mention about the echo piece is that I think there's, there's something important for all of us to remember how, what echoes are in general in our lives, right? Are there echoes of behaviors that we want to not be mimicking? Are there echoes of voices that we'd like to stop and be focused on other voices? Are there echoes of rituals that ha have have been the opposite of um, of inspiring that we want to be able to get rid of. And now we want to focus on the pure sound, right? I know that's a, that's a metaphor for what we're dealing with here, but what are the echoes in our year that we want to kind of shove aside and be able to really focus on that, that pure sound, that the sound that, that really needs to come out. And the Torah that I brought last night to the board meeting is that when we, when we hear of the shofar in the Unatana Tokif, it's shofar gadol yitaka, right? A big, strong sound is going to be blasted. The kol demama yishama, but that you're going to hear a still small voice. So it's a very loud blast. But what you hear and what you focus on is something so much more vulnerable and intimate that that we need to be able to tap into. And here too, it's not that big echo that bounces off of the walls. It's the one sound that comes out of the small shofar. Yeah, Taiwan. And just the way you said that, it reminded me that the biblical name is Yom Teruah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so. Sorry, I just have to move you all so I can see what this is. So this is another text from, from Mishnah Rosh Hashanah. Um, and again, evocative of something that even in modern day, we can think of how to bring into our lives from something extremely ancient, you know, 200 CE. That was, yeah, that was a few years ago. The order of blasts is three sets each. Tekia, Terua, Tekia, right? The length of Tekia, I know it doesn't say Shvarim. Don't, don't, don't come at me. We're, we'll get there. Don't worry. The length of a Tekia is equal to the length of three Teruot. And the length of a Trua is equal to the length of three whimpers, okay? If one sounded the first tekia of the initial series of tekia, trua, tekia, because remember when we blow the shofar, it's in like, it's in sets. So the first set is tekia, trua, tekia. That's why it doesn't say shvarim. That comes in the second set. And then extended the second tekia of that series to the length of two tekia, so that it should count as both the second tekia of the first set, blah, 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 blah. With regard to one who recited the blessings and only afterward a shofar became available to them, they sound the tekia, they sound the trua, and they sound the tekia, and they repeat this three times. So what this is getting at, really the first sentence was the, the part that was most important to me, but the fact that these sounds are repeating themselves over and over again, and that they are supposed to be echoes, no no pun intended to what we were talking about a second ago, of this idea of whimpering or crying or calling out, right? The way in which the shofar sounds is not just haphazard. It wasn't composed by a musician. It was supposed to mimic our voices in times of calling out, in times of asking for something. Yeah, Taibo. And there's this one I think it's in Gemara, but Midrash, which is just so interesting to me that we're, that part of it, one rabbi thought, I think it was one rabbi, that it was patterned on the crying of Sisera's mother after Sisera, you know, whatever. And I just thought that was so interesting, like the same way Matovu is a non-Jewish prophet and whatever, that on Rosh Hashanah, we're supposed to think of the 
crying of the mother of an enemy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right, like we're supposed to put ourselves into a space of of really connecting to emotion through sound, um, which a lot of people do and uh, naturally when they when they hear music or when they hear the shofar. Um, but but to be able to connect an emotion through the sounds that you are hearing and a good shofar blower does this beautifully, right? Really is able to connote those whimpers, those sighs, um, the way of, of understanding the different types of cries. So what in 2023 does this bring out for you? What the different, uh, the different sounds of, um, of voices coming out through, through a shofar that we're supposed to listen to so intently. Yeah, Mike. I I think it's, uh, others the others Mm -hmm. i think it's uh uh you know we're spending a month thinking about how we can become better versions of ourselves, in a sense Mm -hmm. and one of the key ways of doing that is to feel like is to actually act on uh, being a better uh, listener to mm-hmm. others. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. anyway, no, that's beautiful. And I think you use the word "others," which which sometimes can can um, can connote someone that's not like us, but it really just means anyone who isn't me, <laughs> right? Anyone right. else, right? Any other human being, any other life that is not me whether or not they look like me or have the same socioeconomic status as me, et cetera, et cetera. I think you're right that it just means that we need to be able to listen intently to the cries of other people. And I don't mean cries like everyone said, what people are asking for, the way that people need something from us, right? The 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 cries in a way that are requests or demands um, or or begging, right? For other people to hear them. Uh, and I think that is what the shofar, what the shofar is supposed to do. And I think it could be others and it also could just be within ourselves, right? What are the things that we need to hear from ourselves a bit more that we haven't highlighted in our own in our own selves? Um, I, I spoke about this, I can't remember in what context, but this idea of of very easily doing shuva with someone else, but with yourself is very hard. Showing a mirror to yourself is very difficult because not only is it hard for us to um, to think of ways that we could possibly um, not be better. I think we're okay at that, but do things that we've done well again, right? We're not very good at at saying, you did a great job at this. Now continue that. Um, and how can we also hear ourselves need that that kind of love and support? Any other thoughts on the on the shofar takia? In this case, trua takia. Okay. Oh yeah, Paula, go ahead. Well, one of the things that I like about the fact that there are specific notes, yeah, is that in a way it 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 can cont- like sometimes the it contains sort of the <laughs> the challenge of the of the the season mm. like oh i it's going to <laughs> i like that there's going to be a beginning middle and end yeah and that you know that and that there's a sort of a construct of the of what we're s- supposed to do and that yeah. that it's not just you know, this, I hope, you know, it's just not like, oh, I have to look at every single thing I did. And it's mm-hmm. just like, it's a little more compassionate mm-hmm. to have some borders around it, a little, some limitations, at sure. least for me, you know, just like, I, let me pick two things. Let me just, you know, three notes. Let me just pick three notes kind of thing. Yeah. Let me just look at that. It was like deeply. a mantra. Right. It's like a mantra that you that you can say the same thing 
and it feels the same rhythm and you get the same notes, but it somehow like hits differently because you're doing it in a rhythmic way, right? When I call the shofar blast, I get choked up, right? I'm not even blowing the shofar, but there's something rhythmic and powerful about have calling something that then is going to call everybody else to listen, right? There's something very powerful in those notes being the same every single time. And I really love the idea that you haven't fulfilled the mitzvah if you're just like walking through the room and you hear it. Yeah. Like yeah. you have to, and I feel like it sort of, you know, I've like run to grab a kid and go, come on, they're blowing the show far. Right, right. You know, and like, and stopping at the back of the room, you know, because that's as far as we got or yeah. whatever, just to like, to have that intentionality. Yeah. I think it's very, very powerful. There's yeah. a Hanukkah story about where they steal the smell of the latkes. Have yeah. you read? Have you and the and their what they have the family they get the their oh, I don't know what the 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 punishment that they extract or or the the cost that to the family is they have to the you know, the family that had the latkes has to hear the sound of money shaking. Oh. You know, that's the, like, pay for my smell. And the rabbi goes, okay, I'm going to pay. They're going to pay. You come to my study and here's what we're going to do. And he hmm. shakes money. And hmm. so he, it's sort of the, the idea that, no, it's really, there's some, I don't know how to, it just hit me as just this, echo of something they yeah. didn't eat the latkes you were supposed to give them latkes but you right. didn't right. you weren't generous right. so your reward for your lack of generosity is to right. hear the sound of money totally instead of totally. opening your heart or being intentional right Sorry, and to that know that you took something without knowing it that you took something from people who could have been given something instead yeah 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 and shamed them shamed them right for, right, you right. Know, like oh they smelled your latkes Right. Uh, yes, Renee, if you have a hand to unmute yourself. I have a dirty hand, but it's okay. Um, I was thinking of like the different sounds of cry. Yeah. And how that to me was like reminiscent of the different sounds of the shofar. Yeah. That when people cry, there's also different sounds to the cry. Sure. From the shrieking kind of crying that went on in the show uh, to getting hurt to being yeah. happy about the birth of a child or a wedding or whatever yeah and all of those um cries are equally as important to hear actually hear them and not just yeah beautiful. right that that you that you need to recognize what kind of crying you're hearing and and not just see it as an emotion but know what kind of crying that is right is it is it pain is it actually beauty um it, right what what are you experiencing that is that is bringing up that emotion for you and recognizing it and also dealing with others uh in response to that emotion yeah that's a beautiful connection so here are two oh yeah judy i wondered who jk was oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> just figure out how to rename it that's okay <laughs> so um sort of unrelated but um uh, I have a student who's hearing impaired. Yeah. So what, is there anything in the Mishnah or is there anything anywhere? How does one who is hearing impaired fulfill this mitzvah? Yeah. It's a really complicated question. The Mishnah has a terrible answer, which is they don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the way that we've dealt with it in the 21st century is lots of people who are hearing impaired can actually feel sound. I don't, I don't know this student, obviously, personally, <laughs> but can feel reverberation. Um, and therefore they're not hearing it, so to speak, but they are experiencing it. And so sometimes like either holding the shofar or getting close enough to the bell of the shofar such that they can feel the sound, uh, oh. even if they're not actually hearing the tones uh, is one way, but, but the Mishnah and, and therefore the Shulchan Aruch is then very specific about someone who is, they say deaf, right? Cause I think in their world, there was no, like, there were never no levels of hearing impairment. Yeah. So this, we're thinking of a person who completely could not hear at all, that that person may not blow the shofar because they themselves 
if you are blowing the shofar, you need to be able to fulfill the obligation, which is a really painful answer. Um, so again, in <laughs> akin to this class, right, we, we would hope that a person who is hearing impaired could be in a position themselves to somehow get close enough to that shofar, whether in in you know a, a big setting or privately afterwards, to be able to feel uh, the reverberation, so that they too could could feel like that mitzvah had been claimed by them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so here. Here are a few other texts um, on the shofar. I'm not going to spend as much time on these, but I wanted you to just to just see them. This is the Shulchan Aruch, which is saying, if Rosh Hashanah falls on Shabbat, we don't sound the shofar, right? Which is what's happening this year. Um, and it's even forbidden to handle a shofar um, because you're not supposed to really be handling things that you're not going to use on Shabbat, right? It's the whole idea of muksa. Um, so... What it says here is unless if needed for itself, which you're allowed to carry water on Shabbat, for example, because you might need to drink it, right? So unless you needed the shofar, which I can't even think of an example of what that would what that would mean, um, you're not even allowed to hold a shofar. And again, I we, you could see this in two different ways. You could see this as taking something away, and you could also see this as enhancing a time and a space for its sound. Um, and as we've talked a lot about, like the intentionality of that sound is really important. And so intentionality of when and how and what is also really important. And as we all know, sometimes taking something away makes the other opportunities where it's given or gifted um, to be that much more special and and powerful um and then in the mishnah torah it says even though the reason for the shofar is blown on rosh hashanah is because of a biblical mandate right it comes from torah it still has a hint at some meaning as if it says wake up you sleepers from your slumber you've all heard this before get up from your nap nappers sift through your actions and return with tshuva, remember your creator, right? So to go back to this idea of you need to be present, you need to be awake, to be able to be awakened to all the ways that you need to be awake, <laughs> right? And I was redundant about that for a reason, because it's cyclical, right? You're, you are going in a cycle of needing to have that awareness of just being awake, but then also needing that kavana, that intentionality of knowing to hear the shofar so that you can be awakened to something that much more powerful as part of the experience of Rosh Hashanah. Um, well, let, let's go on to the next thing because I, I, I have a few examples here and, and they're not all shofar. So let's go to the Rosh Hashanah Seder. You might not all have a Rosh Hashanah Seder. Um, Rabbi Shapiro has a very famous story about Rabbi Rebecca Schatz that he invited me over for a Rosh Hashanah Seder and I thought it was on a different day. So that's how many times I had done a Rosh Hashanah Seder um, in my life before being invited over to his home where now I go every year for Rosh Hashanah Seder. It's often done on the second night of Rosh Hashanah, meaning not Erev, but the next night. So the night that becomes the second day. Um, and it's something that is, right, it's something that's a Sephardic custom, uh, which is why Rabbi Shapiro does it in his household, because his wife is a Sephardic Jew um, and rabbi in her own right. And so this is something that I wanted to bring because food is a very prominent part of Rosh Hashanah for lots of Jews, but very often for Ashkenazi Jews, it's just apples and honey that are the symbols, right? Um, not necessarily all these other things that you might have included. So as part of this class of bringing something that is that is traditional into a more modern space, I wanted to gift you all with the with an abundance of a menu um, and uh, uh, be able to see the differences um, in in ways that we use produce to actually bring about values that we're supposed to hold on to for the coming year. So the Shulchan Aruch says, and I'm not going to read this in Hebrew, though it makes much more sense in Hebrew. I just, for time's sake, want to want to make sure we get through it. One should eat beans, leeks, beets, dates, and pumpkin. And as one, or really any gourd, it doesn't have to be a pumpkin. Um, and as one eats the beans, rubia, they say, God, may our merits increase yerbu. Those words are the same. So what you're going to see throughout this whole passage is that we are eating foods 
that connect to a blessing that bless us with wonderful things for the year to come. So beans is because we hope that our merits increase. Leeks, so that our enemies will be wiped out. Dates, so our enemies disappear. That's exactly the same thing. Pumpkin, or any kind of gourd, so our judgment can be ripped up and our merits be called out. Um, some of the custom of eating a sweet apple and honey. This is the Ashkenazi voice in the Shulchan Aruch. And say, may a sweet year be renewed to us. Shana tova umetuka. This is what we do, <laughs> he said, but also I'm telling you. Some eat pomegranates and say, may our merits be as many as the pomegranate seeds. And we are accustomed to eat fatty meat and all sorts of sweets, right? To show a sense of um, uh, of wealth, right? To be able to, to, to have that in the coming year. It then goes on to say, you should eat a head of a lamb. Most people do a head of a fish now because head of a lamb seems a bit... Uh, a, a bit crazy. Let us be as a head and not a tail, right? Be ahead of things and not be the end of it. Um, this is also connected to the ram of uh, Isaac and the Akedah, which is something that we read on Rosh Hashanah. So if you're a vegetarian, that's not going to work for you. However, the Shapiros use um, Swedish fish or the, the kosher equivalent of gummy candies, which I appreciate because the head of a fish is not my cup of tea either. Um, so th this is the kind of thing that if you were to bring this into your home, or maybe you already do, this is a way of bringing very traditional blessings, right? Talking about enemies and talking about inheriting based on beans. And right, there is there is something very ancient and traditional about this practice, but put these things on your table and ask your family how they're connected to blessings that they have for the coming year. And I would go as far out as to say, use your own things. They don't have to necessarily be these things. Look up, there's many, many, many creative Rosh Hashanah Seders. You could have all sorts of things that could be symbolic to ways in which we see a better year ahead. You could use symbols from Passover that you are connected to at the beginning of your year, just like you are at Passover, right? You could use an orange. You could use, um, what are other symbols that we've used in the past? A cup of water, right? Different, different symbols that we see throughout our year. This is just a way of bringing an abundance of blessing, not just in words, but also literally putting it into our bodies to embody those blessings. Uh, Renee, you have your hand up. I was going to say the same thing that you said, that that all of the blessings, because we do the Seder every year for yeah. both nights, and that all of the blessings either have to do with decimation or uh, merits being yes. increased. Right. And we also use gummy fish instead of the fish. It's a much better option. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the kids like it a lot better too. Yeah. For those of you who, I guess it was just Mike, but those of you who are listening later, um, Oh no, Barbara was there too. Well, come on. Um, in the Balkans, we had lots of full fish uh, given to us, and it was it was not a Rabbi Schott's favorite. Um, but this is something that you can continue to do, right, with any kind of symbols that are meaningful to you. And it's a great thing if you have kids or if you have people come into your seders for the first time. It's also a great way of getting people to share a blessing without saying, can everybody go around the table and tell me a blessing for the new year? That feels very daunting. <laughs> but if you ask people to choose a symbol on a, on a, it could be, you know, a cheese board in front of them. It doesn't need to be something so, um, so elaborate to choose something and to be able to say, based off of the symbol you choose, based off of the food you choose, what's a blessing that you can give to us for the, for the coming year. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's an activity based, uh, thing to share with you. Okay. Tashlich. So you heard, some of you heard me say earlier this morning, that Tashlich is not something that I've, that I've ever really found myself to be super connected to. Um, but this is, this piece by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, I think will not surprise you to be something that is powerful in a different way of thinking about it um, 
in a way that I hope that you can feel connected to it uh, and would love to hear your, your 2023 uh, or 5784. We could also use that year um, connection to. He says, it's a custom on the afternoon, the first day of Rosh Hashanah, or a temple of the Sunday before, Sunday after, sorry, to go to the shore, ooh, typo, the shore of the sea, the bank of a river or other running stream of water as a symbolic enactment of the words of the prophet Micha. God will cast Tashlich into the depths of the sea, all of their sins. The first mention of the custom is in Sefer Maharil of Rabbi Jacob Moellen. Many folk customs have become associated with Tashlich, among them the custom of throwing crumbs into the water as a symbolic gesture to accompany the process of repentance, tshuva, beginning on Rosh Hashanah as if we were casting away our sins. This practice was dismissed by some halachic authorities and ridiculed by non-Jews. However, it is less ridiculous than it seems. Maimonides writes about the scapegoat on Yom Kippur, right? The, in the Torah reading that we do on Yom Kippur, the scapegoat, over which the high priest confessed the sins of the people and which was then sent out into the wilderness, right? It was sent out, tashlich, that's the same, same word. There is no doubt that sins cannot be carried like a burden and taken off the shoulder, this is Maimonides, off the shoulder of one being and laid on that of another, right? Taken off of your shoulder, but given to someone else. But these ceremonies are of a symbolic character and serve to impress people with a certain idea to induce them to repent as if to say, we have freed ourselves of our previous deeds, have cast them behind our backs and removed them from us as far as possible. That's a funny typo. Thoughts on this, thoughts on how this, um, how this idea of, of casting something away, really what it's not saying is, something is gonna be cast away, but something's gonna come back, right? This doesn't free us, of sin forever. This just frees up as, us of certain things that we are interested, excited to cast away, knowing that others will become a burden to us. Thoughts? I know it's late. Yes, Renee. So one of the, um, uh, what do you call it? Cut, I guess customs that we do when we do Tashlich is that we, and we don't do it on the second day, we do it between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. Yeah. And we write on a note those things that we would like to improve upon in the coming year. And we toss those as well. And then we we uh, end it with kaparot. Yeah. That we do at the at the same time. Yeah, great. Yeah. So that's that's exactly what this is um what this is getting at, except for that you're writing it out as opposed to throwing it with intention, you know, in your mind. But great. Other thoughts? of how this is like a, a modern day, how we could make this a modern day rendition on, on what Tashlich was supposed to be or is supposed to be. Okay. I I think that one of the things that we could, that we could think about in terms of Tashlich is that it's not just setting something aside that you could have done better, but also releasing it. Right. Not just saying, oh, this was bad or, oh, I shouldn't have done this or, oh, I need to do this better, but really having a sense of release, like not going back to it, right? Releasing it, it might come back, but having a sense around a Tashlik practice of just releasing that feeling, releasing that expectation, releasing that idea that never came to fruition, right? As a sense of just really purging yourself of what those things could be. And as Maimonides says here, those things that are a burden, then now if you release them, if you let go of them, they no longer have to be a burden. And again, they might come back because we're humans and our brains don't just work that way in terms of release and unless you're into hypnotics. Um, but there is something to be said for seeing Tashlich as at least the beginning process of of releasing something that is no longer fulfilling you. Okay. I know it's late. So we're gonna, we're gonna, um, we're gonna, <laughs> was that a thumbs up to knowing that it's late? No, you like this piece. You like Tashlich. Okay. <laughs> Paul, Paul is just going to give me hands. I liked, I liked your explanation. I liked your oh, reframing you. it as <laughs> a release. 
Got it. You know, because regret is really very powerful. Yeah. You know, and so that there's some very, the the physicality of it, the doing of it, the thinking, writing it. I kind of like writing it in the sand because it's not disgusting Mm. with all the bread, Mm -hmm. you know, after I don't like the bread in Mm -hmm. in the beach. Mm -hmm. I like that writing it and then letting it walk similar to what we're doing. I like, but writing it in the sand and letting the waves take it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. But that again, that's the going back to that intention of, Mm -hmm. of having a release. Yeah. Yeah. You know, letting go. Yeah. Yeah. Mike. Yeah, I I think it's very interesting when you when you think about the chauffeur or or the or Tosh Leaf and and then you and then it's so much of what we're talking about is intentionality and also um, and re- or releasing something or or taking a burden off. You know, yeah. I'm reminding it reminds me of of how we often think about Pesach. Right, and, totally. In in, uh, in in similar respects, and totally. uh, anyway, I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, and I think I think that's exactly why this class felt relevant to me, right? Because if even if something doesn't speak to you, like Seder Avodah, which we're going to talk about in a second, even if that doesn't speak to you as as something that that you're going to do with intentionality, but it's going to be done for you on the Bima and you're at Rosh Hashanah and you're supposed to feel something. And so I'm going to try really hard. The The main modality for the high holidays is intentionality. So if you can find intentionality by doing something different, but the intentionality is towards the same goal, well, then you're doing it right. Right. So part of, it's actually a really great um, segue into this next piece, which is I'm going to, I'm going to play you a, a tune of something, um, but this is, and actually show you the video for those of you who are actually on, on Zoom and not listening later on. This is going to be a, a modern day rendition of the Seder Avoda, which is the Avoda service. Um, if you are interested in the Avoda service in Yom Kippur in a, in a creative way, thinking from creation to today, Come to Beitenu, Yom Kippur Day, um, on the field. Rabbi Dr. Shosky and I are doing something around that um, that Rabbi Dr. Arye Cohen actually taught at the Board of Rabbis retreat that I was at um, and really brought to life for me what in 2023 we could think about when this is really just a practice of Kohanim that they did in the temple, which we no longer have, we no longer do. So why, when we're all exhausted on Yom Kippur, are we now doing this thing that doesn't feel relevant be- to our to our everyday practice and part of part of this piece from the Shulchan Aruch is that we are supposed to so it, okay let me read what it says even though during the rest of the year we pray silently on Rosh Hashanah we have the practice to play out loud now I looked in the Hebrew to see if that was a typo it's not actually clear that it is a typo Um, And I love that even if it is a typo, I kept it because there's something really beautiful about thinking about praying as also playing, right? That we're supposed to do something with the prayer, especially with Seder Avodah, that gets us to play with this idea of what does it mean to be in a modality of prayer? What does it mean to be in a spiritual space thinking about tefillah and I, so I love that this was there. I didn't look into any other um, translations to see if if it was a typo or not, because I actually don't care. I love the idea that it says play here and that that potentially could be the way that that the translator wanted to translate um, the Hebrew, which isn't pray in that in that sentence. There is no concern about getting lost because everybody has a machzor. Such a hysterical statement, right? You all have a book, so you can't get lost. Have they ever seen the Machsor? I, I get lost and I know what we're doing. It's, it's, a, it's a very hard book to follow. But the Rama, Rabbi Moshe Iserlis, the Ashkenazi voice says, it is the practice that everyone says to their fellow, may you be inscribed for a good year. Why does he say that here? Because what he's saying is just be in community. Who, who cares what you're saying, what you're doing, what you're praying? 
just say to someone Shana Tova, and then you're in a good space to be praying, right? Then you're in a spiritual community. You're supposed to turn to someone and not be lost in the machzor, get lost in the machzor, right? Get lost in the prayers that are in front of you. You're not lost because you can always turn to the person sitting next to you and just say, I hope that you have a great year, right? It's such a relational, beautiful kind of random law in the Shulchan Aruch that seems to be connected to nothing and yet everything at the same time about how we are in spiritual community. Okay. I'm, I realize we only have three three minutes until 8.30 and I want to make sure that, um, especially for those of you, of you on the East Coast, which you are crazy for being here, um, that, uh, that, that I stick to this time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to Go to the next slide, um, but then we're going to come back and listen to this this rendition um, of Isha Ribos that are, um, oh, that was just a little preview. Um, Seder Aboda. Okay, this is, this is this the last slide? No. Well, we're going to do this as the last slide and then I can send you the, the rest if you would like. I wanted you to see this because now we're getting to a place of, of mindfulness um, that brings all of this, I want to do Elul last because <laughs> we're in Elul right now, that brings all of this to a place of, again, to go back to what Mike said, of real intentionality, right? That this is something that we are going to, um, that we are going to tap into, not just by reading, not just by being passive listeners, but we have to have an intention for why we're there, what we're hearing and what we're doing. So what this says, Elul is both an inside and an outside practice. Looking at our inner work and what we need to attend to and how it manifests in our external relationships with others and the world, right? So Elul is something that we do on the inside, but it's actually only going to work if the work that we're doing on the inside is so that we can work to attend to what is on the outside. We all have internal filters and lenses that we use to view ourselves, others, and the world. So this mindfulness practice that I found that I wanted to share says, think about what filters or lenses you might unconsciously use to see or to judge. The world, people, thoughts, prayer, me, but you know, whatever, whatever, whatever it is. How can you make yourself more aware of your conscious and unconscious personal filters? Can you commit to doing something during Elul that supports your being more awake to those filters? So going back to the idea of shofar, right? We're not supposed to have any filters. We're supposed to just hear the basic sound. And so during Elul, being able to, I talked about Elul as being a time to unclutter, right? Taking things out of your cabinets. What surfaces are you finding for those things right now? And what's getting in the way of you being able to put those things back in the cabinets, right? What are those filters that you need to get rid of so you can see exactly what's in front of you and then be able to organize it? Rabbi Lou, who Barbara Brieger is, uh, is want to tell us about from, from her time in, uh, in San Francisco, Rabbi Lou suggested avenues for practice, for practice map nicely onto the yoga, yogic, I didn't know that, that was a word. Chakra system, seven areas of human focus. Okay, so it says above, but it's actually below. Practice stillness and meditate. That one's very hard for me. Examine one area of life and desire. Tie up loose ends. Be available to the suffering of others. Prayer and heat bodhidut, which is a self-practice of being alone, but not being lonely. Rabbi Klickfeld will be talking about that on Rosh Hashanah. Examine methods of perception. Look at the window, not through the window. And then there are a bunch of exclamation points for understanding that higher alignment, right? Being in connection with God. And what does that mean to you? What does that mean to your spiritual practice? So I want to end this I want to end this um, session by playing you this Seder Avodah. And I hope that what you get from this is a way of experiencing the high holidays through today's lens, 
right? What do you need in 5784? What are you going to change about your practice or about the way that you acknowledge prayer or the way that you feed your family so that there is something more, as Mike said, intentional about this 5784 year? And what is it that you're going to do to not get rid of tradition, but make tradition work for you so that it's meaningful and so that it's something that really speaks to how you're entering into this next new year? So I'll play this tune. I'm going to actually play the video um, so that you can see. I think I have to stop sharing my screen to open it. So hold on one second. So you can actually see the words because it's in Hebrew. But if I um, if I play the video, you'll be able to see the words in English. So let me do that. <laughs> Give me one second. Sorry, had it had to start so that I knew that it was there. Okay, I won't play the whole thing because it's repetitive, but you'll get the idea. Nichnas <laughs> lemakom she nichnas. ועמד במקום שעמד בחץ ידיו רגליו טבל עליו ונסתפק בא ממקום שהוא בא והלך למקום שהלך פשט בגדי החול לבש בגדי לבן וככה היה אומר אנא השם כפר לחטאים לעוונות ולפשעים שחטאתי לפניך, אני וביתי. ואם אדם היה יכול לזכור את הפגמים, את החסרונות, את כל הפשעים, את כל העוונות, בטח כך היה מונע אחת, אחת ואחת, אחת ושתיים, אחת ושלוש, אחת וארבע, אחת וחמש. אשר היה מתייאש, כי לא יכול היה לשאת את המרירות אחת, את הבושה, את הפספוס, את ההפסד. בכהנים והעם העומדים בעזרה, כשהיו שומעים את שם השם, המפורש יוצא מפי, כהן גדול. משתחווים ונופלים על פניהם. ברוך שם כבוד מלכותו לעולם ועד. פסע למקום שפסע. פניו לקודש אחוריו להיכל, ולא רבב היו שווים פיו ומעשיו. בא ממקום שהוא בא, והלך למקום שהלך. פשט בגדי לבן, לבש בגדי זהב, וככה היה אומר... So you get, you get the idea, because it goes to the whole Avoda service. Um, and allows you to hear the counting and the way that the Kohen would prepare himself, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Rabbi Wachowski and I do sing this tune, so some of you might have heard it before. It's a very powerful rendition. I think it was written two years ago, maybe last, uh, no, it must have been two or three years ago, I think. Um, but a very powerful way of connecting to something that is so ancient, right? Like there's there's almost no connection um, to the way in which we would experience this today. And yet this rendition of this song so beautifully connotes what is going on and how it was something that was powerful and that we are supposed to embody in doing Seder Avodah on Yom Kippur. Um, so I hope that was a little taste. You can listen to our... Uh, Rabbi Wachowski and I have a playlist and this is on it. So you can listen to that if you'd like again. Um, uh, someone asked for the slides. So let me just pull that up so that you can have them. Uh, can, you, can you send the the song? 
Yeah, sure. That okay. actual song with the spirit saying it. Does he do other parts of the prayers or services? That guy? He does. He does. He has, yes, just look up East Shy Rebo. And, and yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, he wrote a really beautiful tune for COVID actually that was all about um, the different partiot and how the world changed. I played that for me Dorsha once. It was really powerful. Nancy, you want to say something? Yeah, only, yeah. also you can hear Rabbi Warshawski on the Unorthodox podcast from hmm. two or three podcasts ago. And it's the only thing that has really made me feel like the holidays are here. Wow, that's so nice. Yeah, it was, it, it, you know, it brings the tunes, the sounds, the, it just brings it all back. And it was, you know, an excellent podcast. I love that. That's so great. That's great. Uh, I, sh I should listen. I didn't even know he did that. That's amazing. Um, so here's the, here are the slides. You can, you can view them all you'd like. And uh, really just a pleasure to always be able to learn with all of you and Shana Tova, Shabbat Shalom also in this case. Um, and, uh, hope to, hope you have an intentional high holidays. That's really what it's all about. Bring meaning to all the things that you're doing. Don't just worry about if you're doing them right. And, uh, I'll see you all soon. One more question. Do we meet on Thursday?